Divine Truth Interviews Jesus, Mary and others are interviewed by members of the media and the public. Jesus is interviewed by Mary Magdalene on the topic of Divine Truth. The interview was held on the 28th of August 2013 in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. This is Session 2, Part 1. Well, welcome to the Frequently Asked Questions channel again. Uh, this time we're doing session two of the questions relating to divine truth. And if you remember in session one, if you've watched the session, and I, my recommendation if you're watching this particular video that you, and not watched the introduction session, the session one to divine truth questions, then I suggest you do that now before you proceed with these questions. These questions are going to surround the subjects that we raised in the first session regarding what are the attributes and qualities of divine truth. And what, the reason why we're doing that is because the attributes and qualities of divine truth are very defined. And we're able then, if we can define the attributes and qualities of divine truth, it's very easy then to apply these attributes and qualities to things that we hear of in life to determine whether the thing that we're hearing is divine truth or not. And so it's my recommendation that we'll go through these, these attributes and qualities. We're going to discuss them from two perspectives, aren't we, today? Mary's yeah. joining me again today. Yes. And that is, the first perspective is what, are the, what is the attribute or quality relating to the specific quality of divine truth? And then the second part of the question for each attribute and quality is how does that look in our day-to-day -day life? What, what does it look like if, we're, if we understand this at the soul level? What, what does that attribute and quality cause us to do? So that's our focus today. Today we we'll be looking at the first seven qualities and attributes and in another session we'll be looking at the next seven attributes and qualities. And of course the attributes and qualities are not exhaustive and so we need to understand that these attributes and qualities are specifically uh, what we've created to help you define what God's truth is. But they're not exhaustive in their nature. In other words, there will be other attributes and qualities that we can discuss at a later time. But these, we feel, are the 14 most important attributes and qualities that we'll be listing, seven of which we'll cover today. What did you want to say, darling? You were... I just wanted to say, just to remind everyone that it's not an exhaustive, exhaustive list. a definitive list of yeah. qualities about God's truth, of yes. God's truth. Yeah. And in fact, it's impossible to provide a definitive list of the qualities of God's truth when God's truth is infinite in its nature. So, yeah. so that makes sense. Um, but these 14 qualities will help people greatly determine uh, whether what's coming to them from whatever source is part of God's truth or just a part of what person, a person's personal opinion or what people on the whole earth believe, but, but is really just an opinion and not actually truth. So that's our purpose today. And so we'll get started with our questions one by one. Thanks for your time listening today. And I'm sure you enjoy the questions. Quality number one, mm -hmm. what do you mean when you say divine truth is infinite? Well, since God is infinite, and since it makes sense that the universe potentially it has, has a potential for infinite growth, it also then we can logically assume that divine truth itself, in other words, all of God's truth is infinite in its nature. In other, in other words, we will never find out everything that God has done. And in fact, it's interesting because some holy books on the planet actually say that. Mm -hmm. So the Bible, for example, in Ecclesiastes says that that you will never find out everything that God has done. No matter how long you live and no matter how long you investigate truth, you will never find out everything. And that is a quality of divine truth. And it's a logical, if you think about it, it's logical to assume that th this is the case. That being the case, no finite thing can contain something that's infinite. Mm -hmm. And that means that things like the Bible or other holy books such as the Koran do not contain the full amount of God's truth. They, it is impossible for them to contain such. And, and so this quality means that it's impossible for us to contain an infinite amount of divine truth in a finite system. And, and we, humankind, create finite systems. So when we write a book, we write a book and it has a start and an end and might have a few thousand pages in between, but sooner or later it gets too big and uh, for us to manage generally. And so we, we finalise the book 
and have a finite system. But God's truth is infinite. So there's no way, logically, that an infinite truth can fit into a finite system. And the only way, in fact, that truth can fit into us is by our soul growing towards the infinite. Mm -hmm. And the only way our soul can grow towards the infinite is by our absorption of divine love, and that causes our soul to grow infinitely beyond its original capacity. And that then allows the, that particular soul who has chosen to grow with divine love to start absorbing more and more of the infinite truth. And so really in the end, the only book or word of God that will be contained on the planet will be the word as written in those people who receive divine love to the point where they've grown beyond the normal capacity of a human to absorb it. And that's the only way that we can become the word of God. Mm -hmm. So just to clarify, you were saying that God's truth is infinite in its nature. Mm -hmm. So it can never be contained in a finite thing like a book. Mm. Um, and you're saying that we ourselves have the potential to grow infinitely? Towards the infinite. Yes. Of course, we'll never become God mm -hmm. um, because God, by definition, is probably also continuously expanding. Mm -hmm. We don't know that, of course, because we don't, it's hard for the, for the creation to know what created it yeah. as, as, you know, right down to the infinite detail. Yeah. But we do know that we grow beyond our original human capacity if we receive divine love, which mm -hmm. is from the infinite source. Mm -hmm. So as long as we do that, we have the capacity to receive more and more divine truth. We have the capacity to understand more and more of it, but we will never know it all, ever. Right. And Th so That is the quality of divine truth. You are never going to know it all. Mm. So give up the whole concept of trying to know it all. <laughs> and also stop listening to anybody who tells you they know it all because <laughs> they don't. <laughs> sure, great. Mm. Thank you. Good. Regarding quality one, mm -hmm. what does a soul-based understanding that divine truth is infinite look like in my personal life? Yes, now these are very important questions to ask because it's one thing to say, look, God's truth is infinite. It's quite another thing then to understand how or what effect that has on your day-to-day -day life and day-to-day -day existence. Firstly, if I truly felt that God's truth was infinite, I would never feel that a book contains all of God's truth. Mm -hmm. So... I would never say such things as the Bible is the only word of God or the Koran is the only word of God. I would never say such things if I truly understood in my heart that God's truth is infinite. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I wouldn't be in this constant, uh, I wouldn't have this constant frustration about not knowing everything. And in I, fact, I'd never think that I would know everything, would I? Exactly. And in fact, I wouldn't expect myself to know everything, mm -hmm. even. I would have some love for myself for the fact that I'm a finite being created by God with the capacity for growth only by receiving God's love. But as a finite being at any single point in time, I have a finite understanding of anything at any point in time. And instead of punishing myself for that, or, or blame, you know, if, if I'm focusing on other people, you know, blaming them for not knowing everything mm -hmm. instead of uh, wanting a person who knows everything. I'll give up all of those things if I understood this in my soul. Because I'd, I'd know that's not even possible. I'd know it's not possible. Mm -hmm. So what's the point in trying to blame somebody that they didn't know everything? And what's the point of trying to feel that you should know everything? Mm -hmm. You shouldn't know everything. You're not God. You're not going to know everything. You will approach more and more knowledge if you develop this relationship with God. But you, if you are truly connected to this quality of truth, which is that God's truth is infinite, you would know for certain that there's no need for you to know everything. <laughs> yeah. And also that you're never going to know everything mm -hmm. and that there's no book that knows everything and there's no person that knows anything and nobody that you meet now or in the future is going to know everything, yeah. and so you wouldn't expect them to. Yeah. You wouldn't have an emotional uh, projection of anger or rage at them because they didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't feel frustration with them because they didn't know everything. 
you would treat life as a learning experience. You would relax with the learning experience because you wouldn't expect yourself or other people to know everything yeah. because you know that God's truth is infinite and, and when this truth is in your soul, you then do not expect everybody around you to work against that truth. You know that everyone around you is going to have to conform to that single truth. And for that reason, it's a very good truth to know. Mm. It also relaxes you with regard to your interpersonal relationships if you feel this in your heart. Because if somebody has a different opinion to you, you don't automatically say, well, just because the Bible says this, that means you're wrong. You don't say things like that when you know this in your heart. What you go is, okay, I don't know everything. The person I'm talking to doesn't know everything. Only God knows everything. So perhaps I need to listen to this for a bit just to determine whether it's something that I know for certain is not true or, or is true by through experience and through scientific evidence and through mathematical evidence and through experience of life that it is a finish, finishing up to be something that turns out to be true. Mm -hmm. Or maybe there's an element of truth in it. Or maybe there's no truth in it at all. It's just a personal opinion. But, but you wouldn't be dogmatic about those particular things unless you knew for certain and only would know for certain through the proof that you have available with you and not the proof, that so-called proof, that's in a book. Because mm -hmm. the book doesn't contain proof. Mm -hmm. It is just the writings of individuals who have written down information and it doesn't contain everything. <laughs> so yeah. it doesn't contain all the truth that you could uh, potentially learn. And so in your interpersonal relationships, if you understand this principle that divine truth is infinite, you wouldn't be trying to force everybody to know everything. You wouldn't be trying to force your opinion on everyone because you would have this underlying feeling that maybe my opinion might have to change in the future. And if I've forced it on people, and, it, and, and if you look historically at what's happened, we've forced it on people through violence, you wouldn't even do that mm -hmm. because you know that God's truth is infinite and you don't necessarily know it all. Yeah. So why would you then force it upon someone else when you potentially might be wrong? You wouldn't do that. You would just present it and let people make up their own mind. Yeah, okay. And you said this very nice thing a couple of times about relaxing about your progress. Mm -hmm. And um, it would be fair to say, wouldn't it, within that, you're saying we're relaxing with the idea that we're eternally progressing, mm. that we're always going to grow to be looking for, at discovering new truth, finding new things. And becoming more loving. Like yeah. if, if, if God's truth is infinite, it makes sense also that God's love is infinite. And if God's love and truth are in, infinite, then it, and I can receive love and I can receive truth, then it means that I will learn more and more of the infinite truth and have more and more of the infinite love if I choose to do things God's way, but I can never say that I know everything. Mm -hmm. I will never be able to say that I'm as loving as God is. Mm. Never. So can we perfect our love without knowing all truth? Certainly you can perfect your love from God's perspective, um, but you can receive more and more love. So it's like a lot of people on this earth have this idea of perfection, which is when you're perfect, you know everything, you, you're loving with everything, you, you, you understand everything, but this is not perfection from God's perspective. Perfection from God's perspective is understanding that you're a student of God, mm -hmm. a child of God, continuously growing towards God and getting to the point where that understanding is so absorbed within you that you're at one with God in the way that you grow. Yeah. And, and, and you're at one with God in the way you love. So your love now is the same way that God loves, but lower in capacity. So in other words, God has this infinite capacity to love. You, even if you're at one with God, will have a finite capacity to love, but the way in which you love will be perfected. So in sort of in harmony it'll be, with the way God loves. It'll be in harmony with the way God loves. Yeah. Uh, but it won't be to the same extent God loves, because that would be infinite mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're not cap capable as a finite being to have an infinite expression of mm -hmm. love or truth. So again, it gets down to this quality of divine truth that it's infinite, it tells us so many things. And the reason why we've listened at first is because it actually should cause us to pause in so many ways before we start attacking other people, blaming other people, 
abusing other people, being violent towards other people, all of those things would stop if we knew that God's truth was infinite and I'm just a work in progress. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in that, can we really know anything for sure ever? Is that what you're saying? No, I'm not saying that. We will know many things for sure, but we will not know everything for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because only God knows everything for sure. But as we progress towards God, we, we get to have some truth. And that truth, when it does come to us, is a surety. It is certain. It is fact. It is absolute. But we don't know all of it. Yes. We don't know all of what we'll, we'll learn in the future yes. in that place. We only know the truth to that point. Yes. Yeah. And this is part of the quality of divine truth. Mm. Okay. All right. So what can we talk then a little bit about the ways that we will act when we have this soul-based understanding that divine truth is infinite? And um, something I've written here is that um, you will not resist new emotional experiences or the law of attraction triggering error mm. within yourself. Or, or exactly. Me, so, I won't do that. So one of the things we understand when we understand that God's truth is infinite is we understand that we are a work in progress. That means emotionally mm -hmm. and our character is a work in progress. Now, for our character to change and become more godlike, we're going to have to release error. And releasing of error can only occur if we understand how the human soul functions, yes. which is another set of FAQs. Yes. We understand that the only way we can release error is not by trying to overcome it with, with intellectual truth, but rather by the releasing of emotions that cause the blockage to, of the absorption of truth. Mm -hmm. Now, we wouldn't then avoid that process if we understood that God's truth was infinite. We'd go, okay, if God's truth is infinite, I am faced with a future life of infinite growth. That means infinite change. Mm. That means that at some point I'm going to have to give up my feelings that are out of harmony with God's truth and love. At some point I'm going to have to experience them to release them. And so if I understand this fully, I wouldn't avoid the experience. Yeah. I, would, I would enjoy the experience because I know every time... I am experiencing something, I am releasing something and therefore getting closer to God's truth on that particular subject. And I think that's a really beautiful um, place that we can reach where we, we realise, wow, this is an infinite process and, and if I can welcome what's coming to me, I'll just keep growing eternally. Mm. I see a lot of people perhaps have a goal in mind, like I want to be clear of this thing or I want to get better at that thing. Or, well, they become, we're... not only they become goal oriented because they believe that God's truth is finite, they, they believe that when they become at one with God, they'll know everything, which mm. is not true. Mm. You can become at one with God and not know hardly anything, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you will know how to love yeah. and you'll know a lot but you'll not know hardly anything in comparison to what God knows. Mm. But also they do it because they want there to be an end goal. They want to be able to, you know, say, rest on their laurels, as the saying goes, you know, rest, I've achieved this. And, and there's also a lot of competition in the human race where, mm -hmm. you know, I want to get there before you do and all those kind of emotions. None of those emotions would be present, actually, if we understood at the soul level that God's truth is infinite. Yeah, and we wouldn't um, we wouldn't feel like, oh, when I get to this point, then I'll be happy and done. We would feel like, oh, then I'll be happier, but there'll be more happiness and more love and more truth that I can achieve because exactly. God's created me that way. Yeah. And this is where I feel there's this potential for relaxing into this process rather than feeling um, pressured or driven. Yeah, I feel there's a difference between driven and pressure as well. Like, uh, you know, to have a strong desire to be closer to God and have a desire to be more loving and have a desire to act in harmony with the laws of the universe, they're all beautiful desires. Yes. And, and I personally feel quite driven to, mm -hmm. to obtain them. Um, but I don't feel pressured by anybody to obtain them. Mind you, a lot of people try to put pressure on me to obtain them. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> but I don't feel pressured from God's perspective to obtain them. I know that God's always there helping me to get closer to God and helping me to become happier, helping me to become more loving, 
helping me to absorb more truth, as long as I'm open to the infinite process, mm -hmm. the process of allowing myself to change. And, and what I see people doing is, you know, who don't understand that God's truth is infinite, what they're doing a lot is they, they try to become a person that they imagine God wants them to be, but God wants you to infinitely grow. So you're never going to become a person that actually God wants you to be in, in, in a real sense because, because God wants you to grow infinitely. Keep, yeah. keep receiving more love, keep receiving more truth, keep receiving more love, more truth, more love, more truth. And that's going to mean that tomorrow you're going to be different than you were today. Yeah. If you, and, and you've got to be ready for that. <laughs> like, yeah. and, and you've got to want that, actually, yeah. if you really want to progress towards God. And if you understood this quality in your soul, you would know that. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Yeah. All right, how about this idea of not avoiding the process of emotional confrontation? Yes, yeah, so if God's truth is infinite and I, I therefore must change infinitely mm -hmm. to grow towards God, this means that there's something inside of me that's going to have to stretch. I'm mm -hmm. going to have to stretch and be drawn out of where my current position is. And a lot of times we're here on earth we feel quite safe in our current position for a lot of fear-based reasons. And, and so what we do is resist the change. We love to resist change, in fact, even <laughs> if the change is good. Yes. Now, a person who understands that God's truth is infinite would never resist change. They would always want to be changing. Yeah. They would always want to be growing. They'd want it. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't just, you know, they wouldn't go, I don't want to do that, you know, because oh, I, I'm happy where I am. They wouldn't do that ever if they understood this quality in their soul. But we see a lot of people who listen to divine truth doing that. Yeah. So that means that this quality is not, this understanding of this quality is not yet in their soul. It's just an intellectual concept to them. Mm. And often um, we see people modifying their life to avoid emotional confrontation or emotions exactly. or emotions in general. Yes. So creating a lifestyle where there is no confrontation of fear or anger or things that are already residing within them. Mm. And really uh, one of the beautiful things about this soul knowledge, I think, is that it... it, it you no longer feel that way because you know, hey, it's in me and this is an infinite process I'm in. So um, I am can engage it now or later, but it's going to have to happen at some point. If I want to be closer to God, if, if I want to be happier and if I want to be more loving and if I want to know more things, I'm going to have to engage the process yes. at some point. Yes. Now, a lot of people might sit there and say, well, I don't know if I want to be more loving and I don't know if I want to yeah. have more truth and I don't know if I want to become more loving. Well, that's okay. God also is happy with that too. But all of God's laws in that place are going to be confronting that particular stagnant condition. Mm -hmm. And so you're not going to have a, have a happy life choosing that particular thing yeah. as a result of the, of the choice to avoid. You're going to attract many different negative things. So I suggest to people, well, it's far better to understand God's truth is infinite, enjoy the road and, and have a strong desire to learn more and more of it every day. Yeah. You know, and, and in fact, my personal feelings are, why not put that as your highest priority every day? Because it would make sense. If it's going to help you become happier, more loving, closer to God, closer to yourself, closer to your soulmate, you know, and have a much more joyful life, then why would you avoid it? There's, you, it's only because you don't love yourself very much that you would avoid it. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Mm. Okay. Um, uh, something else here, if we understood it well, um, we would follow our desires without allowing fear of the possible consequences to limit us. Yes. So one of the problems that we see happening quite frequently is that people are constantly wanting the truth to be fixed. And because the, the reason why they want the truth to be fixed is they think that if they can set their desire to a fixed truth, then they only need to achieve that and then, then they can relax and, and everything mm. can be fine after that. A person who's truly understanding in their soul that God's truth is infinite understands that their own desires could also potentially grow mm -hmm. infinitely and, and therefore would not be afraid to express their desires even if their desires are out of harmony truth because they know that God's truth will correct it. Yes. They know that through the experience that truth will always come to them and they'll be corrected if they engage their desires inappropriately or out of harmony with love. So they wouldn't be sitting there not doing anything and using as an excuse, I'm not doing anything because I might hurt 
from doing it. Yes. They I might personally I might feel personally pain. hurt. I might yeah. personally have pain. Because they realise that, no, every time I experience pain, I, it's just because I haven't absorbed another truth. And if God's truth is infinite, there's a lot of truths that I need to absorb. Mm -hmm. So that means that initially there's going to be some pain. And once I become a one with God in love, the pain will be gone, of course. So the pain is only the result of the error that exists within me that's emotional in its nature. That's the only reason why the pain exists. And if I understand that God's truth is infinite and, and some other the qualities, I will understand that pain is only going to be present while I'm out of harmony with that love that comes from God. Yeah. Not out of harmony with the truth, because even when I become at one with God, I'll still be out of harmony with all of God's truth. Yeah. So it's all about the love or the lack of it that causes the pain. Yeah. Yeah. So basically we're painting a picture when we have this soul-based quality within us of a life where we are embracing uh, change. Mm -hmm. We're not manufacturing our lifestyle to be comfortable. No. We're actually saying, okay, this is an infinite process I'm engaged in. There's no end point really. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to just engage with every situation, uh, allow confrontation to happen because I understand it's going to have to happen continually actually mm -hmm. as truth confronts the error inside of me mm -hmm. and um, I'll and, be... and remember that only this is only happening until we're at one with love so so it's the love or the lack of it that causes our pain mm -hmm. not the lack of truth mm -hmm. and this is a I feel a very important thing that people need to understand it's the lack of love or the past experience of the lack of love in our lives that causes our pain. It's not the lack of truth in our life that causes pain. Mm -hmm. Because at all points of time, pain is caused mm. um, through only the ex lack of experience of love. So you can be in total disharmony with truth, but have a, be in a loving environment surrounding you and being in harmony with love yourself and therefore everything would be happy. You'd have no pain. Right. How can I be in harmony with love if I don't have any truth? Well, eventually you have to bring yourself in harmony with truth as well. Obviously, that's a part. The two, and, and this is another quality. Remember, all of these qualities are not, um, they're not one or the other. So what we're doing here is discussing one facet of one quality. Yeah. Right? And what I'm saying with this facet of this quality is that we are allowed to be out of harmony with truth as long as we're loving. Mm -hmm. God's laws all work this way. They allow us to be out of harmony with truth. So we can become at one with God in love and still be out of harmony with truth, with all of the truths of the universe. Not all of them, obviously. <laughs> we could be out of harmony with many. We're going to be out of harmony with a large variety of truths in the universe, not all of them, because we'd have already brought ourselves into harmony with the truths that need to be taught to become at one with God in, in love. In love, yeah. yeah. Sure. So, so we need to draw the definition of, like, and the distinction that we need to have truth to become more loving, but there is a point once we become at one with God in love and we've absorbed the truth that allows us to get to that point, from that point on, there will be no pain because from that point on, we still will be out of harmony with all universal truth, or most of it, because universal truth is infinite. Mm -hmm. So God allows us to be out of harmony with truth, but the universal laws do not allow us to be out of harmony with love. And we need to draw that distinction. Sure. And you're also saying that the truth that exposes the error creates pain because it's exposing the truth that we have not been in a situation where love was present. Yes, basically I'm saying that it's not the truth that creates the pain. No. It's the error that resided within that we thought was true, that the betrayal of that that creates the pain. The pain. Yeah. So the pain is actually created by the error-based position, not by the truth position. Mm -hmm. And the error-based position was caused by an unloving event. In, in other words, we can have a truth or an error, sorry, we can have an error inside of us that wasn't caused by any event that was unloving. It was just something that we thought. We will have no pain getting rid of it once we see the truth. Yes. The only truths that will, the only errors that we'll have pain in getting rid of 
will be the ones that had an emotional signature associated with a lack of love. Mm -hmm. And these are the ones that are going to cause pain. And so we need to understand that pain might be a process, but it's only a finite process. Until we become at one with God in love, then from that moment on, being at one with God in love, there is no error within us from the point of view of truth that will be painful to release because we're at one in love. Okay. Okay. Quality number two. What do you mean when you say that divine truth is of itself a thing apart and admits no variations or modifications? Yes, this is a very important thing about divine truth and one of its qualities. It doesn't allow people to modify it or change it. It is existing whether we know it or not. So, so if I can give perhaps an example. The law of gravity existed before humanity discovered it mm -hmm. and continued to exist after humanity discovered it. And humanity discovered it through a gradual process. And particularly in modern times, when I'm talking about the last couple of hundred, you know, four or five hundred years, we discovered it through a process of experimentation. We then, through the measurement of different instruments and so forth, we had the capacity to measure it even from a mathematical perspective. But once we discovered it, it didn't change. It was still stayed the same. It was still the same law that governed its operation. And this is one of the qualities of divine truth. Just because we haven't discovered something yet, it doesn't mean that the truth doesn't exist. Yeah. It still exists, even though God may be the only one who knows it. Mm -hmm. And as such, we can't expect to have our own opinions about it. Sooner or later, our opinions will have to change to suit whatever the truth is about it, God's truth is about the particular thing we're trying to discover. So, for example, mankind comes up with all these theories about what causes cancer. Yeah. But God knows the absolute truth about what causes cancer. Sooner or later, all of us on earth are going to have to come to terms with what God's truth is about what causes cancer and, and not we have our own theories about it. The way God's designed the universe is we won't eradicate cancer unless we Until deal with we the do. causes. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Until we find out God's truth, we can't eradicate it. Mm -hmm. And this is what I find quite uh, interesting about this quality is that until we discover what God's truth is about any subject, we will not be able to fully understand what's going on with any subject. And, and this is a very important part of divine truth, that it doesn't conform itself to human perception or opinion or human reality. It is the reality from God's perspective. And humans, of course, can create their own realities, their own ideas. Yeah. But, and just because everybody on the planet agrees with something, it doesn't mean it's true yeah. from God's perspective. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's, um, in, if we contrast that to our personal truth... Yeah, well, you know, that's... As we've contrasted in our first session, personal truth, basically, we can have as many opinions as we want and get away with it. Yeah. <laughs> We're allowed to take on any opinion we, we want when it feels good. But that's not the case with God's yeah, truth. Yeah, so our personal truth is changeable and God's truth is unchangeable. Unchangeable. Yeah. And it's unchangeable whether we've discovered it or not. It's, mm -hmm. it's immaterial to God whether we've discovered it or not, in fact. Whether we're aware of it, whether we know it, whether we have an inkling of it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't it's, matter. It's, it's still, still the same truth. It still exists. It's still the same truth. And it exists whether science has discovered, whether the mathematics understands it, whether all the, it's still mathematical and scientific, mm -hmm. but we might not have discovered the science or the maths that would explain it yet. Yeah. And so, but in the end, we, we will. We will discover as uh, any of the truths that are out there, particularly truths in the physical universe and the spirit universes, um, they'll all be discovered sooner or later through a process that we, but, but this process will not involve us negotiating with God and saying, I think it's my idea. <laughs> In the end, it will be saying, okay, I give up my idea and I accept that this is, this is the truth of it. Yeah. And it's interesting, I see people doing this in a physical way a lot. Like, you know, so when it comes to the, the discovery of physical truths, we're prepared to give up the idea that our opinion really matters. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. But it's interesting when it comes to emotional and spiritual and other types of truths, which are all still a part of God's truths, mm -hmm. we don't feel that, that our personal opinion doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. In fact, we hold on for dear life with our personal opinion generally, and that is a primary problem with mm -hmm. regard to this particular fact. When we do that, we are not understanding at all. God's truth knows of no variations and modifications. No matter what you do, you're not going to change it. Yeah. No matter, you've only got the ability to discover it or not. That's your choice. And within that as well is the idea that, or the truth that it's existed. That's really what you're saying, isn't it? It doesn't get updated. It's, no. it's existed before we knew it. It'll exist it exists after afterwards. We knew, after we know it. Uh, and, and it doesn't change because we've discovered it, and it doesn't, and it still exists before we discover it. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a very beautiful thing about God's truth, isn't it? Is. It, it is. Yeah. And one of the things that is beautiful about that, of course, is that is that it means that that God's not changing the universe constantly and changing all the truths on a daily basis, and so we're left in total confusion. Mm -hmm. You know, when certain things are engaged in a certain way we always get the same results. That's the, that's the beautiful thing about this immovable aspect of God's truth, is that God's truth, when it is opposed, has a certain result, and when it is employed, has a different result. Yeah. And it's consistent every time. Yeah. It's just like the law of gravity, consistent every time. And until we discover a higher law, which can overcome it, yes. like the law of aerodynamics, the law of gravity will work consistently every time. We can send people to the moon understanding that law mm -hmm. because it's consistent every time yeah. and that's what's lovely about God's truth it's very different to a human parent isn't it very a human true. parent one day says one thing the next day says another <laughs> thing depending on the circumstance and situation yeah. and uh, and this is one reason in fact why most people don't understand that God's truths are fixed and immovable they they think that God is like a human parent and so they think that God's going to change his mind tomorrow mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. not the case at all it's always going to be fixed and immovable and it's a loving thing that it is because it allows us to discover it and once we've discovered it, we know it for certain. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful part of God's, this fixed and immovable quality of God's truth. So, yeah. so this quality number two, very important to understand as well from mm. a soul-based perspective. Great. Mm. Okay. Regarding quality two... What does a soul-based understanding that divine truth is of itself, a thing apart and admits no variations or modifications, look like in my personal life? Well, there's quite a lot of ways I feel it would affect our personal life if we really believed this particular quality and understood it in our heart. Mm -hmm. And the key is understanding it in our heart, not understanding it in our head. But if we understood it in our feelings we wouldn't firstly try to negotiate with God about truth. Mm. Like we would understand that God's truths are fixed. It doesn't matter how long in the past, how long in the future, they're still going to be fixed. There's nothing we can do to change them. We, either have, we only have a choice. The choice is discover it or don't discover it. Yeah. That's our choice. Yeah. We don't have a third choice and that is change it. <laughs> we don't have that choice. Yeah. And... Um, and I feel quite frequently mankind wants to have the third choice, of course. We want to change what universally happens rather than actually discover what universally happens and why. Mm. And I can see that on a, like a macro level and a micro level. Certainly. In that, yeah. you know, a lot of us want to be able, or globally really there's a consensus that we would like to be able to keep taking from the earth all of its natural resources and polluting it and feel that the earth's going to be, be okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and God's truth is, nope. no, you're creating damage and there's consequences. And, there's going to be consequences. and you can't avoid that. No. Even, even if there is a consensus on the planet about something, if God's truth is different from that, exactly. th then we're that's going to create the mess. <laughs> yes. Because you can't avoid it. Yeah. yeah. God's laws are attempting to correct. Yeah. That perspective. Yeah. Mm. And on a on a like on a micro level, if you like, in one person's private life, mm -hmm. I see how a lot of us there might be something f from our past that happened that we haven't dealt with. Mm -hmm. We harmed someone. Uh, we did something that we even know mm. it was not morally right. Mm. And yet, 
a lot of us try to make excuses for ourselves, put off dealing with that for like years and years and decades. Mm. Um, but God's truth is that it did happen mm. and we can't change that. And there's only a few ways we can make it go away. And, and even those engage different laws of God as well. Yes. <laughs> so, so you can't make it go away just by hoping it will go away. Yeah. That doesn't work because everyone who tries that, it never works. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, you know, these are all parts of understanding that, this, that God's truth is immovable. You, you either conform to it or you understand it or you don't discover it or don't conform to it. That's your choice. But at the end of the day, if you don't conform to it or you don't discover it through ignorance, then there'll be less happiness in your life. And if you conform to it or discover it because you want to, there'll be more happiness in your life. And that, that is a fixed and immovable result yeah. of God's truth being fixed and immovable. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, some other things you've listed here. When we have a soul-based understanding of this truth, we don't complain that God's laws feel harsh and uncompromising. Yes. Uh, see, what, what I suppose what a lot of people on earth believe is that if, if, a, if a law is fixed and immovable, then it means there's no compassion. Yes. They believe this. And, and the reason why is most people on earth want to negotiate with law. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, they might be driving and speeding and the law of the land is, you know, 110 kilometres an hour, you know, along this freeway or highway is the extent of your speed limit and you do 130 and then you get picked up by a person who's trying to enforce the law and you try to negotiate with him. Oh, you know, I was in a hurry, I was this or that or whatever. And then you go to court and you try to negotiate with them and, you know, and, and we don't understand in that place that while we might be able to negotiate ourselves out of the results of mankind's law, mm -hmm. we will never be able to negotiate ourselves out of the results of God's law. And that's a loving thing, actually. And the reason why it's a loving thing, it means that the law is applied consistently to every person without consideration of their background, of their marital status, of their sexual uh, orientation, of their cultural background, of their uh, gender background, or any other thing. Mm -hmm. It is fi fixed and applied consistently every time yeah. whether you agree with it or not it's <laughs> going to be fixed and applied constantly at every time and and that that's god has done that in order to show us how to love to teach us about love yes to teach us about love in a lot of ways in, in the sense that love would would never want me to have a different result to you mm -hmm. love wouldn't you know love two people in a different way if you truly love, you don't feel like one person is more important than the other or less important than the other. You honour that both are equal in God's eyes and need to be equal in your own. These are qualities that, that are exposed through these laws that are unable to be modified. And, and so this is a very important thing to understand, the in, importance of the fact that God has provided consistent truth, mm -hmm. consistent laws. God is a consistent parent, mm -hmm. not a parent who modifies things based on personal opinion or personal feelings. And God's personal feelings are consistent, mm -hmm. unlike most persons, personal feelings on earth, and particularly unlike most parents on earth yeah. feelings yeah. towards their children. God's laws, structure, truth is always consistent. Mm -hmm. yep. And I suppose that's what you're really saying about having a soul-based understanding of each of these qualities, aren't you? Mm. That when we have a soul-based understanding of them, we, we recognise the function and the love within each of these truths. And also we put that into our personal practice in our day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. So in other words, when we interact with other people, we don't make agreements with them that we try to renege from mm -hmm. or that we try to get out of. If we've made an agreement with a person and the agreement ha has been formulated and firmed up, then, then even if it's painful for you to follow through with it, then because you need to honour this consistent part of God's law, you would want to follow through with it. Yeah. And the only time you wouldn't be able to is if it was physically impossible for you. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you wouldn't try to negotiate your way out of it. You wouldn't try to go to court and to get out of it. You would want to do it. And you'd only not do it 
when it's physically impossible yeah. to do it, to not yeah. do it. And, uh, or when perhaps the other person was lenient and decided, well, I can give you a break, you know. Yeah. You would only do it under those circumstances when love was present. And you'd realise this is a factor of love as well as truth. So there are lots of ways that this particular quality, quality number two, would affect you in your day-to-day -day life. All right, just two final things then to clarify, to ask you, you've yeah. written two statements here and I would like to ask you how they relate to this quality. Sure. So you're saying when we have a soul-based understanding that divine truth admits no variations or modifications, then we feel that when we're in pain, it's because of our own emotional error. Mm -hmm. And we feel that God's universe is loving and pain is the result of disharmony with that loving truth. Mm. So um, do you want to expand on that in any way? Certainly, I think it's fairly self-explanatory, yeah. but... but because God's laws are fixed and God's truths are fixed, it makes sense that every single truth or every single law is going to have this quality that when we break it, it's going to have one kind of effect and when we live in harmony with it, it's going to have another kind of effect. So when we break it, it's going to have an effect that is painful mm -hmm. and when we live in harmony with it, it's going to have an effect that is pleasurable. And that applies to other people who break it around us as well. So if you break a law that affects me, I'm going to also feel some pain as well as you. And this should help you understand the importance of change and not wanting to break the law because mm -hmm. it's affecting me as well as yourself. Now, if I was truly understanding that God's laws are fixed and immovable, I wouldn't be trying to always get away with breaking the law and breaking the truth. I would want to discover it. Mm -hmm. I would want to know it. I wouldn't be trying to avoid it through ignorance because I know that ignorance is dangerous. And if you think about uh, life here on earth, many people think ignorance is bliss. But the reality is in God's universe, ignorance is dangerous. Mm. Like if you don't know that, uh, and, and this is why children are often placed in danger, right? Because they don't know their ignorance causes them to not know things. And, and as a parent, it's our, our import, important that we instruct them about certain things. So, so they climb up on top of the roof and try to jump off. They don't know the first time they try to do that, if they ever attempt it. That, that, that's pretty dangerous. Like <laughs> yeah. there's a chance that you're going to hit the ground at some speed and potentially break bits or even die, right? That's the danger. Now, the first time they do that, or even if they do that in a macro, you know, in this small level, uh, just fall off a step. They realise, wow, you fall down, it's dangerous. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> they, they get that feeling because God's laws are consistent about it. We know that feeling is going to be present. And as a child, they then learn through this experience that every time they are ignorant of a law, it creates more danger mm. in their life, not less. Mm. And this is what we need to understand as adults. Every time we are ignorant of God's truth and we choose to be ignorant of God's truth, God's truth doesn't know any modification. It's still going to operate the same way as it always has. Yeah. And that means that if we're ignorant of it and, and purposely trying to be ignorant of it in particular, then, then we are going to find ourselves at, with quite a lot of pain and suffering in our lives because we're choosing to live in a dangerous situation. Mm -hmm. Now, when you get to know God's laws, they will feel really beautiful and you understand them and there is no danger. So because God's law knows no modifications and is consistent always, there is, once you discover them, there is this beauty that results in your life, safety that results in your life. Like most people on this pres on, presently on the earth are so afraid of a lack of safety. Well, if you want to be safe, know all of God's laws. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Be Find out as many of them you can. <laughs> because because they're so loving, they actually ensure our safety when we comply. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And so we, we start to see them. We start to see God's truths. And remember, laws are just God's truths. Yeah. Like the law of gravity is just a truth about gravity. Yeah. The law of aerodynamics is just the truth about aerodynamics. Mm -hmm. So if we look at spiritual laws, the law of attraction is just the truth about how our soul attracts things. Yeah. And the law of cause and effect is the truth about the relationship between something that happens and the fact that it had a cause. You know, there's all these laws that we have that are all just really truths. Mm. That's all they are. They're a framework within, uh, that our soul can exist within. Now, we can choose to ignore them all if we want, 
but they don't know any modification. They're going to operate whether we choose to ignore them or we choose to discover them. Yeah. Now, it would be better to discover them than it would be to ignore them <laughs> <laughs> from a personal perspective yeah. and, and also from a global perspective. And this is why I feel it's such an important quality to understand. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank mm. you. Okay. Quality number three. What do you mean when you say divine truth and love are always in perfect harmony mm. and without truth, love cannot be complete? Mm. And you could also say without love, truth cannot be complete yeah. as well. But uh, this is something about, about lo uh, love and truth that we need to understand is that truth supports love. Mm. It doesn't pull apart love. It doesn't degrade love. It actually improves it. Yeah. And, and if we have love, it will always, if we look at things from a point of view of love, we will always discover more divine truth, more of God's truth. Because every one of God's truths have inbuilt in them perfect love. Yeah. Perfected love mm. is, exists within every one of God's truths. Mm -hmm. So if we look at the truths about gravity, there, are lo there is love in that truth yeah. about gravity. Mm -hmm. And there's all sorts of reasons for that gravity to exist that, that actually cause the harmonious operation of our own life and the existence of all sorts of organisms that are in the gravitational field. Mm -hmm. It actually allows love to exist. And this is a beautiful thing about God's truth, divine truth, is that it, it always is in harmony in perfect harmony with love. So every single thing that we ever discover, physically, emotionally, spiritually, soul-based, all of these laws that exist, and there's a hierarchy of them as well, all of these laws that exist, which are all truths, exist in a framework of love. Yeah. And in fact, if there is a postulation by a person on earth, an idea or a concept of a person on earth, that there is a law that's out of harmony with love, you can pretty much immediately dismiss it as a possibility mm. because all of God's universal laws, all of God's universal truths are completely in harmony with love itself. Yeah. Yeah. And it's such an important thing to understand, this relationship between love and truth. And love from God cannot actually flow unless truth is present in that instant. Yes. If we look at the growth of the human soul, mm -hmm. which is a, one of, of, you know, what I feel is of primary concern, you know, how the human soul functions. The reality is that we cannot grow towards the infinite without receiving divine love. However, divine love being received is going to depend on our willingness to accept the truth about how it's received. Yes. Now, most people don't believe that. Mm -hmm. Most people believe that love can be given without understanding anything else. And that's not true, actually. True, pure love is dependent upon the openness to receiving truth. Mm -hmm. Universal God's truth. It's the, this openness to receiving truth that will help us understand and actually help us absorb love. And if we wish to reject the truth that the love is exposing, then we will not receive more love. Mm -hmm. It's impossible to receive more love unless we accept the truth that the love that we've already received has exposed. And, uh, and this is why I feel most people have a short period of time where they receive divine love. And then they stop because they're unwilling to be humble to the fact that they have not yet absorbed the truth mm. that the love is telling them they need to accept. Right? So if I can, maybe we can give some examples in the question that, the that follows. Question, yeah. But it's important to understand that this is a quality of divine truth, that there is this direct association mm. between God's love and God's truth. One can't be had without accepting some of the other. Yeah. And so it's very Which is important. very powerful. If and you, powerful if you to say know. say that again, like you can't receive God's truth unless you're open to God's love. Exactly. And you can't receive God's love unless you're open to God's truth. Exactly. 
And the two are in harmony with each other, always. It, always. Yeah. So if we look at the first scenario where we can't receive God's love unless we're open to truth, if, you, if you're not open to the truth that God exists, if you're not even potentially open to that truth, in other words, you're not, you're not at least saying perhaps God exists, yes. you will never ask for love mm -hmm. from God. Mm -hmm. That's reality. You yeah. will never receive it as a result. And so you will never grow as a result. Yeah. Now, let's say you are open to the potential of that as a truth mm -hmm. and you decide to ask for God's love, and so you do, and you receive some. Now, along with that love will come some truths packeted with it mm. that you have the choice to receive or not. Right? Now, if you choose to not receive it, you will block yourself to receiving further love. Yeah. So you'll be asking God to receive love and God's going, no, 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 you, don't, you haven't accepted the truth about the love I've already given you. Like The love I've already given you tells you that you need to love your brother and your sister the same. And yet you don't. You, 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 know, you love women more than you love men. Mm -hmm. So that's out of harmony with the love I've given you already. You, know, you need to address that truth and then you, you may receive some more love. And God's always trying to indicate to us where these issues are because the law of attraction and these laws of cause and effect, they are laws that have been created by God to expose to you where you have not received the truth. So there are truths about those laws, because remember, every law is just a truth about how, what we attract. In the case of the law of attraction, or what we cause, in the ca case of the law of cause and effect, mm -hmm. what are the causes, every single one of those laws are truths. And if you don't accept them, then you're going to stagnate in your ability to receive more love, which will expose more truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's like a growing process, and it, I sort of liken it to going to school in some ways. Yeah. You can't grab a child who's five years old, who's never been to school and never been educated at all in, by its parents, and place it in university and expect it to understand anything. It may not even understand the language that's being used, even though it's the same <laughs> language it's grown up with in the first five years yeah. because of the different acronyms and other things that may be associated with the university degree. So what it has to do is go through a, a process of growth where it receives some truth, it understands more things, it receives some more truth. It uses the truth that it's used as a foundation and it receives more and the foundation becomes larger and then a construction basically happens inside the individual where they're capable of receiving more. Mm. That's how God is working with us every single time. There are certain truths that we will not be able to ever accept unless we accept truths prior to it. Yeah. And there's a certain amount of love that we will not be able to ever accept unless we act in harmony with the truth prior to it. Mm. And so this is something we must need to understand, this harmonious balance between love and truth. Yeah, yeah, very beautiful. And, and it gives us, a, understanding this truth gives us a lot of um, things to work with, doesn't it? Mm. Oh, I'm not receiving love. Well, love's in harmony with truth. What's the truth I'm ignoring here? Exactly, Yeah. exactly. Yeah. But also it helps us go, okay, let's look at these universal things I'm trying to discover. Yeah. Whenever it's out of harmony with love, and if I can detect any disharmony with love in what is happening, yeah. then I know that my concept of what the truth is about the subject probably has to change. Yeah. Because it's a, because it, the love is the lack of love is telling me that there's probably also a lack of divine truth. Because mm -hmm. divine truth and love is perfect harmony yeah. every time. So so if I look at a theory that's presented to me, let's say it's a religious theory such as God only loves the people who believe in Christianity. Mm -hmm. That's a religious theory that one and a half billion people on the planet believe. And of course, God only loves the people who believe in the Koran. There's another million, billion or so people believe in that. Yeah. And, and in fact, if you think about it, those two beliefs are completely opposite each other, <laughs> really, in, yeah. in, in, in terms of their understanding. Yet both faiths have the same belief about their own faith. Mm -hmm. Now, let's look at it from love's perspective. Does it make sense that God would only love a group of people who believe in a man-made written book of a certain type? 
It does not make any sense mm. from the perspective of love. It would make more sense that God would love any person who's willing to love. Yeah. And if God truly loves, it would make more sense that God loves any person, no yeah. matter what they're willing to do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that would make the most, yeah. uh, that would be the most harmonious with love. So therefore, it's highly likely that it's also the truth because it's the most harmonious with love. And so what we can do is we can analyze teachings of the world and we can list them all and we can, we can go through, is this harmony with, in harmony with love? Is this in harmony with love? Or is this out of harmony with love? My understanding of what love is. And we can just dismiss teaching after teaching after teaching, Bible verse after Bible verse, mm -hmm. Quran verse after Quran verse, yeah. and other holy book verses after holy book verses. We can just dismiss immediately by asking that one question, yeah. is this in harmony with what I know love to be at this point in time? Yeah, and it'll be great because you and I are going to have a discussion on the qualities of divine love as well, aren't we? Mm -hmm. And so really when you've got these two um, discussions side by side, you mm -hmm. get to see, well, uh, from what I understand from that discussion about what divine truth is and what I understand about divine love, you've got a great sort of... Um, way of weighing up all kinds of different theories and ideas. And honestly, it's simple. Mm -hmm. It is so simple to determine what is the truth when you understand these qualities properly. Yeah. Yeah. You understand, and this is, this is why in the first century I found it so simple to discover truth. Mm -hmm. Even though I was indoctrinated by my father and others in the way of the Torah, the, you know, the, the, the first five books of the Bible in particular, but also of the prophets, even though I was indoctrinated in those faiths, I didn't believe in them because all I knew was that here we go, this is out of harmony with love. You know, my mother had to go away for 40 days every time she had a child. That seemed to me to be out of harmony with love, you know. Every time she had a menstrual period, she had to go away for seven days and nobody could touch her. That was out of harmony with love and, and so forth and so forth. There were so many things out of harmony with love. And, and, and okay, they can't be the truth then. Mm -hmm. Quite simple. They mm -hmm. can't be the truth because I know... Got from God's perspective, and by that stage I was about 18 years of age, and I could see very clearly that from God's perspective, everything would have had to be in harmony with love. Yeah. And in harmony with the love that far exceeds any person's love on earth. Mm. And so when we understand this quality, there are so many things we can, we can understand and work through in terms of what is truth and what is not. Mm. Great. Okay. Regarding quality three... Mm -hmm. What does a soul-based understanding that divine truth and love are always in perfect harmony and without truth, love cannot be complete? Mm -hmm. What does that understanding look like in my personal life? So now we are asking this question from a personal perspective, okay? What it, what it, what it looks like personally is this. I will never accept inside of myself a teaching that is out of harmony with love. I would never hold on to that teaching, I would never take actions about that teaching that are out of harmony with love. Mm -hmm. So if I was in this space properly, I would never resort to violence about something that I believe. I would never even yell at somebody about something I believed. I would hold on to the fact that love needs to always be present when truth is present. Yeah. So I would never revert to violence if I truly felt in my heart that this was true. Now, if you look at the history of re or the religious history of humanity, almost every religious faith has, without fail, reverted to violence at some point in its history because other people did not believe what it believed mm -hmm. or what it stated you should believe or what it stated you should do. Love would not do that. Love would not ever revert to violence. And so therefore the teachings that they, they were reflecting cannot be true yeah. under, this, under this rule, uh, this principle of divine truth. The teachings cannot be true. Only the, t the only teachings that can be true are the ones that promote love. Mm. The only teachings that can be true are the ones that promote understanding, that promote the ability to live in the universe in a happier way with more contentment. They're the only teachings can, that can be true. This is why there's a lot more scientific truths than there are religious ones on the planet at the moment because more of them have resulted in an easier life, a better life for many people on the planet. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. therefore they are more in harmony with love 
than the religious teachings that people proclaim are about God. Mm. And so, you know, this is one of the primary things that would happen. I would see any time I resort to violence, any time I resort to anger, any time I resort to frustration, any time I try to, by force, control somebody else with regard to the truth, I'm out of harmony with love. Therefore, what I'm doing isn't the truth. Yeah. I've got to change yeah. if I really want to become in harmony with God. Mm. Okay, so what about when, with regards to our relationship with God and receiving love from mm -hmm. God, I, wouldn't, I also wouldn't expect to receive love from God if I am avoiding truth in my personal life, would I? Exactly. So you get to a point where you're going, okay, I don't want to know this, I don't want to know that, I don't want to know this, please God, give me some more love. And, and probably not receiving any in that place. You wouldn't be feeling like you're receiving any. I'm, pro I'm it, definitely sure yeah, of that. Yeah. And, and then you go, oh, it's all God's fault <laughs> that I'm not receiving God's love. <laughs> or it's not fair. Or it's not fair. Yeah. Or it's not whatever. Yeah. No, it is completely fair. You're, yeah. not being, you're not wanting to live in harmony with love. Yeah. How can you expect to receive more truth? Yeah. And if you're not willing to receive more truth, how can you receive more love? If you're not willing to live in harmony with the truth you already know, then how can more love come to you? Mm. It can't. Mm. So stop trying to bend the rules. Yeah. <laughs> stop trying to you know, circumnavigate God's way, which is always to confront this, this, this beautiful quality of divine truth, which is truth and love will always be in harmony. You need to bring yourself into harmony with the love you've received. Mm if you're ever going to receive more truth and love. Mm. So do it. <laughs> choose to do it. Don't choose to avoid it. Don't try to get away from it. Don't, don't use your will in a negative manner to harm others or harm yourself. Choose to do something that's harmonious with love, even harmonious with love of yourself. And that is be in harmony with the truth you know you need to be in harmony with. Yeah, and I suppose I think about this on a very personal level, that if I know if love and truth are harmonious, how can I say that I'm a loving person if I'm not truthful about what's inside of me? Exactly. How can I say I love you if I'm not being truthful to, to you? Exactly. <laughs> how can I um, uh, be in a, any kind of social... How can I love the government familial... if I'm not true with the government, truthful with the government? Yes, any kind of relationship <laughs> yep. if I'm avoiding truth within that relationship. If I know that love can't be present unless truth is present, then that really changes a lot of the ways we analyse what it means to be loving, doesn't exactly. it? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Because a lot of us feel or have been raised to feel that it's loving to withhold truth. Exactly. Like we've been raised to think the opposite thing of God, that God believe, it has created as a fact in the universe. And so can you uh, maybe talk to us a little bit about this um, idea that is that kind of drives that thought, that when I say the truth, it creates pain, not love. So yes. why, do we, why do we believe that? Well, we believe that because the error within us was created over a long period of time, and the error is very painful. It causes all sorts of immediate painful results. But unfortunately, we have a tendency to desire to live in it because the world lives in it. Mm. And so what we do then is we absorb it, it becomes a part of our life and it becomes a part of our self-definition. It becomes a, what we believe to be a part of ourselves. And when you've got to give up what you think is a part of yourself, it's going to be painful mm. in, in a process. Now, the truth, God's truth when it comes, exposes this error. And this is one reason why we believe the truth is painful, is yeah. because it actually exposes error. It makes us see the truth and therefore causes us to have to feel the pain of the error. Mm. And then we go and make this mental association and heart-based association that, oh, the truth caused my pain. No, it did not. It was the pain was caused by the untruth present. And the, if, if the truth was present and there was no untruth present, you would have no pain. So if I can give an example of that in a person's day-to-day -day life, let's say they're in a relationship and a husband and wife relationship, uh -huh. let's use an, as an example, and the husband decides he's gonna cheat on his wife and then he decides that he's not gonna tell her and then he decides that he's gonna do it again and not tell her and do it again and not tell her, right? So, so she's oblivious to the truth, but there is already pain 
being created in a relationship, in the husband, in his heart, in the woman who's connected to the husband in, in, in the sexual relationship that's not a part of her, his relationship with his wife. And all that, there's all this pain already being created, mm. right? He's oblivious to it because he doesn't want to face the fact that love and truth would be acting in harmony with each other. Yeah. He doesn't want to tell the truth to anybody. He doesn't want to tell the truth to the woman that he's not going to leave his wife because of security reasons or whatever. He doesn't want to tell the truth to his wife because then his wife may leave him and then all of his security issues may be triggered and all mm -hmm. half of his wealth may disappear. And so what he does is he keeps this thing happening on the side without telling any truth. Now, when somebody comes along who notices it's happened and tells the wife that it's happened, at that point she will feel a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. If she's not careful, she will believe that it's because somebody told her the truth. It's not because somebody told her the truth. The reality is if somebody told her that and it wasn't true, it would cause her no pain at all. Right? If it wasn't true, it wasn't happening, it would cause her no pain at all. Mm -hmm. It's only going to cause a pain if it actually is happening. Because? Right? Because it's the error that creates the pain. It's not, exposing. It's exposing what's the pain. The happened. truth exposes the error, but it's the error that created the pain. Yeah. It's the fact that he cheated on her that makes her feel hurt. Yeah. If he didn't cheat on her, she wouldn't feel hurt. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, but a lot of times we don't want to know the truth. And this is a big problem on the planet too. We need to understand that the desire to know truth is directly connected to the desire to love. Yes. We need to have both if we're ever going to live in a loving society. We see on the planet with the media, for example, we, that, that the media is willing to feed us lies and we're willing to take them, right? And we've got to ask ourselves the question, is this loving? Mm. It's not loving to anybody. Taking a whole heap of lies and feeding people lies is not loving either. So, so we need to have more of this honour of the connection between love and truth. Now, if we did that, if we actually felt that in our soul, mm -hmm. we would never be able to lie about anything we've done, even if what we've done might cause the breakup of our family, might cause us to lose our job, might cause us to be in jail for a while, might cause us to do lots of things. If we tell the truth, we would never avoid it. Because we would know that our love cannot be real. And also our love um, can never grow by avoiding it. Yeah. We know that. The other thing um, that occurs to me as you're talking about all of that is that having a soul-based understanding of this truth would lead me to know that if someone is telling me a truth and I have pain about it, that that's exposing an area yes. where I don't have love. Exactly. It's similar so, to so what you were saying the, earlier. Let's give the similar example, shall we? Okay. Uh, like, you yep. know, the example with the husband and with his wife, if she feels that someone telling her the truth, let's say he's not cheating on her, mm -hmm. and yet someone comes along and tells her that he is, and she gets all hurt, mm -hmm. then that's her hurt. There's something inside of her that is caused by a lack of love within her that causes her to feel that hurt, and she would understand that. Y yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So just perhaps to finish off this point, uh, maybe just let you know some of the other notes that you've written here and mm -hmm. perhaps you'd like to talk to them. Mm -hmm. So when we have a soul-based understanding of this truth, then we don't have a desire to convince ourselves that we're receiving dis divine love when we're not. Mm. So it's like, it's like, how can you continue to receive divine love when you know you're out of harmony with truth on certain subjects? You can't. And if you're trying to convince yourself you're receiving divine love when you know you're out of harmony with truth, then you're receiving something else other than divine love. <laughs> you know, it could be connections with spirits or it could be your own imagination or whatever. You're definitely not receiving God's love while you've chosen to be out of harmony with truth. Yeah. Mm. Okay. And um, I don't wish to help others avoid the truth that they're not receiving divine love. Yes, it's sort of like this, uh, I see this happening quite a lot, particularly in religious circles, you know, particularly in the Christian religious faith where a person receives divine love to a certain degree and because of their feelings for God and their feelings for the desire for that love. But, but then there's certain truths they don't want to accept. They want to believe in the Bible and as I've pointed out in previous answers, 
the Bible is not a great record of God's truth and it's also not very loving in many places, but they might want to believe in the unloving passages mm -hmm. in the Bible. Mm -hmm. In the process of wanting to believe in that, they are blocking the reception of more love, of more love from God, and also they are blocking the absorption in their soul of any truth. So what are the truths that, of God's laws about these particular subjects? They're blocking all the knowledge of that. Under those circumstances, they still want to believe they have a continually growing connection with God. Mm -hmm. But they need to be told the truth. A continually growing connection with God is only possible by continually growing in connection with truth. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about the universal absolute truths, not the ones that are contained, the so-called truths that are contained within a written book, but the actual universal truths. They're the ones you're going to have to conform to at some point. So we need to stop telling each other that we're going okay when we're not. And we need to be honest with each other with the fact that unless we receive more truth, unless we live in harmony with the truth we know already, and unless we're willing to examine what we believe is truth in the light of love and change our opinions based on what love would dictate, mm -hmm. then it's impossible for us to continue growing. We are going to stagnate. And this is why I notice many religious faiths, they have the initial improvement in the reception of love. So they receive some love from God in, initially when they find the faith or in the short periods after. And then they stagnate because they get into fixed belief systems which oppose the absorption of love. They oppose, they're not in harmony with love. And in fact, when we act upon them, we actually ourselves are out of harmony with love, mm. which has its own compensatory effects. Mm. And as a result of that, we're not absorbing truth either. We're not, we're not living in harmony with truth. We're not understanding this soul-based thing that we need to understand, which is love and truth are perfectly aligned with each other. If there is a truth that's out of harmony with love, then it's no longer a truth. It's just an idea, a concept, a man-made concept. It's not an absolute truth of the universe. Yeah, <coughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Quality four. What do you mean when you say divine truth does not and cannot compromise even for the sake of peace? So divine truth has this beautiful quality about it that, that it will never know a compromise. From the points that we've already raised, we can see quality number two is that divine truth is immovable. Mm -hmm. And quality number three is that divine truth is always loving. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if it's immovable and always loving, it will not be able to compromise because that would make it movable. Yes. And if it's always loving, it wouldn't promote war, mm -hmm. but it would also not compromise for the sake of maintaining a false peace. So here we're talking about a false peace, not a real peace. Real peace can only occur when we bring ourselves into harmony with all of God's laws. That's the only time that real peace can occur. Mm -hmm. In other words, you and I will have exactly the same idea on one of God's truths as each other. And that's the only time that there will be actual peace between us, mm -hmm. that we'll actually feel peaceful with each other. Error has a quality or a nature, and that is that it always tries to violently defend itself. Mm -hmm. A person who is in error wants a person in truth to conform to their error, and they are prepared to revert to anger and violence, manipulation and abuse, control and other things, in order to enforce the error upon the person who believes the truth. A person who's in truth will not be movable on the subject of truth. Once they know the truth, they will not be able to move, in fact. To do so would be to compromise love, compromise personal love of self, compromise love of God, compromise love of others. So they have to be immovable with regard to the truth. And as, as a result of that, they are not going to compromise even when somebody is prepared to attack them and abuse them and harm them. Now, we see many examples of that in the world in which we live, but perhaps we need to leave the examples to the next question, which we ask sure. about the personal examples. Okay. So this is a quality of divine truth that we need to understand, that, that we're not, if we are in truth, if we're in harmony with God's truth, 
we are not going to compromise for the sake of somebody else avoiding somebody else's attack of us. Mm -hmm. Now, we see this happening all the time, mm -hmm. people avoiding attack by compromise. And then they expect to have a relationship with God. And you can't maintain a relationship with God if you are willing to avoid attack through compromise. Because to do so would be to move away from the truth. Yeah. And the divine truth is immovable. You can't move away from it. You can't compromise with it. So this is a very important aspect of divine truth to understand. Yeah, and you mentioned that... Um so this idea that divine truth won't compromise even for the sake of peace, but would always be peaceful. Yes. And so in that, we would never be warlike when we're in harmony with divine truth, yep. but neither would we compromise if threatened with war. Exactly. And that's on a large scale, but even in a small scale within a personal relationship. Exactly. We would never actually be aggressive or abusive or violent. Yes. But we also wouldn't compromise on what we know is truth under the threat of violence or uh, abuse. Exactly. So when we come up with the examples, we can talk about some of those examples perhaps, but... That is exactly correct. We mm -hmm. can't expect to compromise truth and actually make it better. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I, think, I feel there is a, a constant uh, belief on the planet that you can make a situation better just by compromising with some truth. Yeah. You can't. All of God's laws are supporting truth. So every time you compromise the truth, you actually make the situation worse than if it was or would be if you hadn't compromised. So that's the sad fact of life that we engage here on the planet is that humans generally believe that you can compromise the truth and have a better outcome. Mm -hmm. No, you can't. If you compromise the truth, you'll have a worse outcome. That is the way God has designed this quality. This quality of divine truth is such that if you compromise it, you are going to have more unhappiness. You can't have peace by compromising truth. You can only have peace by both parties understanding truth. <laughs> you can only have peace by both parties feeling love. That's mm -hmm. the only time that peace is achievable. So you can't have peace by the compromise of truth. Great, thank you.